your final speaker, number seven of six, <laughs> Catherine Reed, is a medical student at Imperial College London. She strongly believes in the importance of pushing the limits of scientific knowledge and is proud to say that her theories remain, as ever, unhindered by such trivial restrictions as accuracy. <laughs> Please put your hands together for Catherine Reed. Good evening. The evolution of man is as good as defined by our transition from four legs to two. This was pretty much a terrible idea. <laughs> it makes us more unstable, but with further to fall, and it directs pressure through our bodies in ways we just aren't adapted to handle, causing back problems, unstable joints, and a frankly unnecessary degree of pain every, <laughs> every time we tread on a Lego. The best known theory of bipedalism at the moment comes from Darwin, who said that we needed our hands free to use tools. But this can't be the only explanation for the origin of bipedalism. Fossil records show us that we didn't start to use tools until at least 1.1 million years after we began to walk on two feet. Instead, we must look for clues from the rest of the animal kingdom. Although there aren't many other genuine bipeds, we see frequent acts of spontaneous bipedalism in a variety of other mammals. <laughs> These incidents occur almost invariably in moments of intense terror. Fleeting bipedalism seems to be the first preparation that the animal makes to flee. This is actually not a big surprise. Pulling yourself upright forces the body to work harder against gravity and the increase in exposed surface area. Um, it raises our heart rate and our blood pressure. This is exactly what you see when you get a big kick of adrenaline. But to be forced to stand upright all the time, humans must have been subject to some pretty persistent anxiety. With that kind of level of stress, it's no wonder our hair fell out as well. <laughs> so what happened to induce this constant state of fear in our ancestors? Socializing. <laughs> the thing that really sets humans apart from other animals is our sense of self-consciousness. We are the only species capable of blushing or of recognizing ourselves in a mirror, only to brood agonizingly over what we just saw there. <laughs> Being social animals is an intrinsically stressful activity, with an ever-present danger of crushed egos, isolation, and embarrassment. As humans were made to constantly interact with a variety of bosses, co-workers, family, extended family, friends, casual acquaintances, potential love interests, and seemingly endless others, we were driven into a perpetual state of panic to which running around on two legs all the time was an adaptive response. <laughs> Let's examine the evidence behind this theory. First, we know that early hominids were not actually fully bipedal. We seem to have risen more completely onto two legs as we've become um, more cognitively aware. <laughs> Increasing intelligence would only have made us more acutely conscious of our own social failings, deepening our intense insecurity as we became more capable of mentally simulating why some other caveman might be mad at us. Was it something I said? Is this about the time I mistook a homo neanderthalensis for a homo denisifer? That was a weird night. Okay, um, so the only... <laughs> The only early humans who would have survived the increasingly cutthroat world of social pitfalls were those with the baseline adaptations to keep themselves in a state of hyper-awareness, with their hearts pumping, adrenaline flowing, and stress responses switched on. Another unusual human feature is our propensity for endurance running. This is clearly not designed to allow us to get a long way from predators over a short distance even, or, or to hunt fast animals. What it does do is allow you to get a really long way away from that stranger you just waved at because you totally failed to realize they were actually greeting their friend who's right behind you. <laughs> this also explains the dopamine rush we get after prolonged exercise. It's the brain's reward system telling you that you did a great job getting away from another tricky social interaction. <laughs> We can also see some evidence in the way we carry out our social interactions now. 
When we meet someone new, we often stand up to greet them. This is preparation to run. <laughs> Meanwhile, babies happily spend all their time crawling or lying around just like any other quadruped, right up until they're driven to learn to stand around the time they start understanding human speech. <laughs> By the time we're adults, we only really manage to get in a solid, uninterrupted eight or so hours of lying down if we're totally isolated from social interaction when we're asleep. Most of our other leisure activities, when we do manage to relax, also involve sitting or lying down or drinking alcohol. We all know that alcohol affects our balance. It's generally believed that this is due to actions on the cerebellum. But now it seems more likely that once our social inhibitions are lowered, there's simply no need for the body to devote energy to staying <laughs> upright. Finally, we can now explain a recent and otherwise incomprehensible phenomenon. Lately, employees have been pushing the idea of the standing desk. <laughs> this may well be a means to assert social dominance. Yeah, your colleague with the new desk gets praised for their fitness, but more crucially, they're going to be the only one hyped up enough to finally send Tony from accounting that passive-aggressive email he deserves. <laughs> So now that we've accepted that fear is inherent by pedalism, what does it mean for us now? Recently, we've seen a huge increase in social anxiety. We've struggled to find a reliable source of blame. Parenting failures, social upheaval, the internet. But now that we know the truth about bipedalism, we have another target to explore. Fitness movements have been increasing in prevalence. <laughs> to our bodies, this just feels like, I need to get away from another difficult conversation. Exercise is psychologically damaging. <laughs> It is time, finally, that we stop going for jogs and embrace sitting, lying around, and generally lying flat on our faces on the floor. Thank you. So what you're telling me, then, is that there are clear, tangible health benefits to getting legless. I think it could definitely have some, some psychologically beneficial aspects and, and potentially physical as well, if we assume, you know, we, we really shouldn't be standing on two legs all the time. This is a really bad idea. Um, I, I really enjoyed your hypothesis. Um, Thank you. Obviously, anthropologically speaking, there are different cultures all around the world that experience different levels of, of stress because of different levels of, of, of things and everything like that. Um, it stands to reason that different cultures experience different levels of social anxiety. Mm -hmm. So if this is correct, wouldn't that also suggest that the more social anxiety a society experiences, the better their posture would be? <laughs> and also the better their cardiovascular fitness would be? I think this is definitely a good area for, for more exploration, yes. Okay. <laughs> I, um, I like your use of the, of the cat example. <laughs> um, are there any other examples of cat videos <laughs> pertinent to this research? I think if there aren't, then it's something that we absolutely need to change. I mean, have you seen what they do when they see a cucumber? <laughs> if I can just follow up with one of my panel members, seeing cat videos does not help your cat jokes. <laughs> You're kind of vicious. <laughs> I love it. I think we're done. You may leave Catherine Reed. <laughs> <laughs>